Yeah. We're good to go. There you go. Good. Okay, so is that now it says that he can hear us. Oh, but he's not muted. Paul, are you there? Still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, it's quiet, but I can hear you. Uh, I got it on. I got it on full volume, and I'm talking as loud as I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll 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 figure. We're gonna go ahead and get going. So at this time, okay. we'll go ahead and go back into open session. Um, all board members are present. Mr. Green is with us via phone. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and flag salute Carl, if you wouldn't mind, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time, go ahead and um, in closed session, we took action on items 9, B, C, and D, 2. That was voted on, uh, motion by Diane, second by myself, um, passed unanimously, and then D1. Um, motion by Diane, second by Carl, and that was a three one. Um, those items will be available on the website at a later time. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and go into school reports. We're going to start with the junior high. Who do we have for the junior high? Who do we have for ALMS tonight? Me, could you hear me? Sorry. Kennedy Crosco. Okay. Hi, I'm Kennedy Crosco. I'm here to tell you a few things that have been happening at the middle school. It's echoing. Parent teacher conferences. This week is parent teacher conference week at Angela Parents are meeting with their students, fifth period teacher, through a phone conference or virtually using Google Meet. Student Art Showcase. Students have been emailing in pictures of their artwork, pencil sketches, paintings, and online artwork to be that have been favorite choice of art genre. Students' artwork will be posted for all to see on ALMS social media account. All students who participate will receive a participation prize. Positive discussions with Mrs. Sinekian and Jeter. Last Friday afternoon, Mrs. Sinekian and Jeter had two special guest stars. Diamond and Echo, trauma service dogs from the Kings Canyon District Attorney's Office. Together along with their handlers, they assisted Jeter with implementing a social emotional learning lesson of self on self-awareness. At this time, I would like to share some pictures from this event with you. Is there a way I could present or like be able to present my she wants to slide. Thank you. 
one right here. These are some pictures from Positive Discussions with Mrs. Sinekian and Jeter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're having an echo. We're still having it. So are we experiencing, does everyone up here need to have theirs on mute? Okay. It was because she was at, okay. on her end. All right, okay. we'll go ahead and go on to the high school. We have a special guest reporter tonight. All right, so I'm uh, Guillermo Lopez, proud principal of Summer High School, and I'm, um, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of our uh, ASB uh, representative, uh, Jasmine Plaza. I'm sorry, I should have brought my glasses. So, um, again, I'm going to be speaking on her behalf. Um, we just finished Spirit Week. Uh, we gave out T-shirts, candy, play music as parents and students drove by, and people did not get out of their cars. Uh, we are reaching out to help victims and uh, first responders for the Creek Fire, and we are taking donations uh, to give to the Central Valley Canned Food Service of Fresno. We are working on two more murals for the campus, one on the east wall, the 1500 wing, and the front of the main gym. We will be conducting another Spirit Week in October for a Halloween week, in the, in the, and we are in the planning stages. We're also working with Mr. Lopez and Chrissy Rangel, to outreach uh, to our students in need. And this is gonna be uh, based on a student survey that's gonna be created uh, to be sent out to the students. And we do also have a update on athletics. Um, the Central Valley Sequoia League is working on a schedule for JV basketball and soccer winter sports uh, that will be more that will be modified. And it would also, um, so that freshmen and sophomores wanting to play JB softball, baseball, tennis and track, swim and swim, will be able to have the opportunity. This is for the lower levels only. Modifying the league's schedule would allow them the opportunity since the winter and spring sports are now starting two weeks apart. The other uh, reason is for that some of the smaller schools that compete in our league will not have enough students to fill in the sports uh, for the three seasons being considered uh, or being condensed into two. And lastly, it says Bear Nation is working hard to make sure that our athletes and facilities are ready. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And then at this time, we'll go ahead and go into special recognition, which is all the high. <laughs> Come on back. Let me get my stuff. Right. So I guess I'll introduce myself again. Uh, good evening, uh, <laughs> Board President of Winter, Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Fisher and Executive Cabinet Team. Uh, I am Guillermo Lopez, proud principal of Selma High School. Uh, this evening, I wanted to share out updates of our campus and recognize a group of individuals that have been instrumental to our school's reopening via distance learning model. Our sites administration, teacher and staff have been working dil 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 diligently, sorry, to ensure that our students are having access to quality education via distance learning model. We have been making adjustments to our delivery of instruction based on HB 98 and have been continuously closing the gaps of access to Chromebooks and hotspots based on their, their availability. We have held virtual um, grade level parent information nights and recently we have our, our virtual back to school night. And I would also like to thank Dr. Fisher, Mrs. Wood, and all the other district administration 
who joined us during these events. With the six weeks uh, grading period ending, our enrichment program began on Monday, September 28th. On Mondays during our allocated time and Tuesday through Friday via small group intervention uh, grouping as needed. In closing, I would like the opportunity to thank the following individuals for the following. Mr. Mike Palesi, Activities Director, Mr. Saul Barbar, our art and digital animation teacher, um, and Ms. Salinas, Ms. Salina Rodella, our art teacher for the work uh, with our Better Together mural in the front of our gymnasium. This art piece has been instrumental for our staff even more than ever at this time uh, in order for us to be together and come together for the best interest of our students. Russell Mitchell, Matt, uh, our, who was formerly our math department, um, uh, department chair, Rosemary Montoya, ELD, Forrest Castle, and Ms. Tony Lambert, co English department chairs, Michelle Laux, co science teacher, Mr. Luke Leedy, social science, Mr. Sean Wise, the assistant principal, Ms. Gaylene Gaudio, um, formerly our, our English coach, Ms. Debbie Richardson, assistant principal, uh, Ms. Cherry Carrasco, intervention teacher, Ms. Nympha Plaza, foreign language department chair, uh, Ms. Mrs. Angela Morris, special education department chair, Mr. Jacob Bailey, and uh, our VAPA lead. This is our team that collaborate and work together in the spring 2020 and summer on our reopening of our high school. Our high school is in a better place thanks to the knowledge and input of all these individuals. Lastly, Mr. Mark Batista, Guadalupe Sandoval, Elsa Vargas, and Yvette, uh, Yvette Alves for all their support with IT during this distance learning instructional model. They have gone and continue to go above and beyond, not only to serve our staff and students, but our whole community on the drop of a dime with technology needs. Thank you for the opportunity to share and showcase the great work that our staff is doing at Selma High School as we have been, um, as we will continue to do, the uh, to do the best that we can for the best interest of our students as we are better together. Thank you. And Mr. Lopez, I'm gonna set, there's a whole stack here for the teachers. I'm gonna set them over there on the edge of the desk. Okay, okay thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and open up the floor for public input. Anybody wishing to address the board regarding anything that is not listed on the agenda, I'll give you a, um, a few seconds, 30 seconds or so to do that. Go ahead and type that in the chat box. Okay, seeing nothing in the chat box, we'll go ahead and close um, public input and go into special presentations. I'd like to say good evening to the Board of Trustees tonight and to those who are joining us online. I wanted to take uh, a few moments this evening to provide uh, the board with an update with regard to where we are with COVID-19 uh, numbers in the county as it relates to our schools and the reopening and the returning of students to campus. So um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and start with a little background information and then go forward. Next slide, please. Um, on August 28th, the governor um, introduced a new system for the state of measuring COVID-19 um, and looking at uh, ways to reopen the economy. And so with that, there were modifications to the state's rating system for being able to uh, reopen businesses and return students to schools. And there are four color-coded categories, purple, red, orange, and yellow. 
and they are in order from highest to lowest risk with those colors. Purple counties are those where the, county, where the, uh, the epidemiology and the rates are the highest. And um, if you are in a category that is purple or a county that is in purple, that is a county that has the most or the highest risk level and the highest number of restrictions. So just briefly, I wanted to be able to have you take a look at that color-coded system and the tiered systems. Next slide, please, for the counties. So this is the system, and currently um, Fresno County is in the purple tier. And you can see what the criteria are that lands you in that tier. This information is updated weekly, and it's based on uh, current uh, data that's being received from within the county. And that data is uh, compiled to give us a new metric each week. We received an update today, and I am pleased to say that our county is continued, continuing to demonstrate a decline in the two areas that would dictate whether or not or how soon we can bring students back to our campuses. So the two areas that will dictate that are the positivity rate and the number of cases per 1,000. So uh, as the purple level is the very highest tier, we want to be able to be moving towards the yellow. And so in order to move to each band, you will see there are criteria that you have to meet. So today we learned that uh, Fresno County's positivity rate is now 4.8. Last week we were at seven, so we're seeing some decline there. And then our case per 100,000, we're at 6.5, an adjusted rate of 6.3. So we can see that there's been some movement and there's been some decline in the number of cases and the positivity rate. So one of the things that we have to remember in this new system is that um, it's designed so that you can't move from a, a very high level all the way down to the very lowest level. You have to move through each tier and you have to remain in that tier for a period of time. So we are pleased that we are moving toward red and um, being in a given tier for a period of time will determine how soon we can reopen our schools. We know, uh, next slide please. So in order for schools to reopen in-person instruction, this is very important, the counties must, um, must not move to, into an, the lower category. You have to remain in that category for t at least two weeks. And once you get into that category, they have to monitor and you have to stay consistent and not show any decline for uh, 21 days before you can move to the next tier. So there are a lot of restrictions that are put in place at this point to alleviate um, the opening and closing and the restart of uh, businesses having to close. So that's why the color system has been changed a bit to mitigate the ping pong effect of opening and closing businesses. So for schools, we're watching very carefully now that we've moved into the red level, how soon can we know after being in this red level, can we reopen schools? So currently, we have a call in the morning at, at 10 o'clock. We'll be looking at whether or not we can do this as early as um, October 13th, somewhere around there. But we have to follow all of those benchmark criteria to determine whether we can do that. And we won't know that in terms of bringing everyone back until around the 13th of October. So that's the date that we're watching very, very carefully. Um, now this is the process for bringing everyone back. However, the State Department of Public Health 
has issued two options for districts who might be able to move a little sooner in terms of getting students the help that they need. One way is to be able to bring students back in very small cohorts of no more than 14 students and two adults. And in that process, you bring students back, you have to monitor the cohort, and you have to be very careful and very strategic about who you're bringing back in those cohorts. That's one way. The other way is to apply for what we call a K-6 elementary waiver. So a thing that I need you to remember is there's two processes. The small group cohort process does not require a waiver, but we have to have clear things in place to bring back only a very, very myopic small group of students to get the extra help they need. The other would be to apply for a waiver, and there is indeed a process for that. And we'll talk about it in just a minute. So this information just shares with you that there is criteria and there's a purpose for bringing small, small group cohorts together. And the purpose is to provide instructional supervision and support for the students with the greatest needs. And the recommendation has been from the state level and from advocates is to start with our special day class students. And those students would be brought back to the campus or to um, um, a designated hub within a community. And they would, uh, would work with instructional support providers that provide more supervision and just a little bit of help. They are not providing the direct instruction because it's very clear with small group cohorts, schools have not reopened. This is just an option to try to meet some of the needs of the most needy students. Um, so again, this is a method for making sure that we're meeting some of the targeted needs of students while schools are still closed. So as you can see on this first bullet, it's not meant for regular instruction, but it allows for small groups of students to be brought back, specifically targeted small groups of students, to work with in-child supervision and support. These targeted support services may also include students that need occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language services and other things that they're not able to receive through distance learning. Even through this model, there are very strict guidelines that we have to follow for cohorts. And I'm gonna share a little bit about what those specific guidelines are for bringing back small group, small group cohorts. Next slide. Again, a maximum of 14 students and two adults. Um, within each cohort. Each cohort must be self-contained. You have the same adults working with the same students for the duration of the time. So that might look like we would bring back our special day class students whose parents agree that they would want the extra help and we may put them in a vacant classroom at the school site or they may work in the lunch room at the school site but we still have to observe social distancing, masking, and all the required guidelines. But it just gives those students a little extra help. Um, one of the things to remember is that that group stays together for the time that they're getting that extra help. The, the supervisors will take them all out maybe and let them run around for a little bit to get the wiggles out maybe take them all out together to go to the bathroom breaks, but they move as a group, as a cohort. And part of the um, reason for that is to really monitor any contact or any spread if anyone gets sick. So that's part of the guidelines. Next slide, please. And I've, I've just shared these things. The cohort model is to decrease any opportunities for exposure or transmission. And we, are, we do have things in place to um, monitor um, and be proactive 
so we can mitigate any exposure, including t taking temperatures when they come, six feet social distancing, wearing of masks, and we have a plan that we've had to um, develop that Ms. Wood will be sharing a little bit later. So we have two processes that we can look at for re-engaging with our students. The first way, small group cohort. Doesn't require a waiver, it just requires us to set up strict guidelines for how we're gonna do it. The other process is K-6 elementary waivers. This, um, this requires um, that we submit an application to the County Department of Public Health following a list of criteria that they want to see. Are you gonna be able to bring back elementary students safely? Are you gonna be able to maintain six feet social distancing? Can you do that? And, um, and if you're able to do that and we meet all the criteria, the county will grant a waiver to, to be able to do that. So right now, you, you probably have heard that some school districts are applying for the waiver. LEAs don't have to apply for the waiver. That's subject to what your local conditions are like. The conditions in one community may be more suitable to bring back students than they are in other communities. So the public health department is provided this option so that communities that have less community spread and have fewer cases might be able to move in this direction based on their local needs. Local LEAs and local boards are not required to apply for a waiver. It's an option. And so the thing that I want us to be clear about is that there are two options. You can go the K-6 waiver or you can go the small group cohort waiver. Currently, um, next slide please. Let's see what I have next. Okay, currently our, dist our county numbers are on the decline which is good. We want to be able to get to the point where we can actually bring students back as quickly as possible. But we also want to be strategic and we want to be safe as we're doing this. And so I wanted us to just take a look at what we um, presented earlier at, in the summer, in the late, the end of last school year with regard to our plan for opening schools and just kind of bring this back to everyone's recollection. We always intended to be able to bring students back as quickly as possible if the county situation improved enough to be able to do that. Our plan for bringing students back has always been a hybrid model where students would come for two days and then be home for three days. That gives each, student, each group of students two days a week in the classroom with their teachers. And we've always shared that we would do that when the conditions improved enough to be able to do that. So we have options. We're getting close to that. And we may know by the end of October if we're able to do that, bring everyone back in a hybrid model. And so one of the things we wanted to have some discussion with you about tonight is we know we're getting close. Do we want to consider applying for the waiver or do we want to wait until we're able to actually bring all students back if it's closer towards the end of October? Or many districts like the colleges and universities are saying we're coming into flu season. There are still a lot of variables and we're still seeing some communities whose transmission rates are very high. We're going to hold and we're gonna refine what we're doing. We're gonna work with the small groups of the kids who are most at need and then bring all students back in January. This is what many districts are also considering because of the things that are happening with the refinement of um, our, our distance learning, the ordering of technology, things are still being received, moving towards small group cohorts and addressing the kids with the greatest needs gives us an opportunity to track and monitor what it will look like when we bring everyone back. 
because bringing everyone back will require us a little bit of time to be able to work through um, our staffing and getting staff back on site and making sure we have everything in place. So we've had some initial discussions with our uh, extended cabinet and with our principals. Um, they are supporting definitely bringing back small group cohorts of students, starting with our special day class students, and then moving to students that are still having connectivity issues, foster youth, migrant, being very specific, but continuing to watch our numbers in the county, because right now they're still a little volatile. And um, we heard that um, uh, districts are exploring doing that and then bringing everyone back at the beginning of the next semester. Our semester ends December 18th, I believe, for the high school. So there's been some concern about disruption and we're starting to get into the flow and how, what a dramatic change it would be for high school alone to be able to switch for 30 days and then go off. So we saw something just today. Was that today you sent me the email with regard to Irvine and the, the pushback there was that there's no way you should bring high school students back just yet before the end of the semester because of all of the transitions that have to occur. So our, our, our thoughts right now are that we would move forward with the small group cohorts. It doesn't require a waiver and we can address the needs of the, uh, we can address the needs of students with uh, the greatest risk level. We can spend a little time piloting and working through things before we bring everyone back and um, be ready to continue with our plan to bring fo uh, all of our students back in January would be what the team is proposing. But we wanted to see what the board's uh, thoughts were and if there was a, uh, ideas to move in another direction. We're beginning, we're having a conversation with the union also with regard to the small group cohorts and bringing them back. We'd like to be able to do that by October 12th. We can do that regardless of whether the county moves into the next tier. So we want to be able to get some feedback from, from the board at this time. And we know that districts around us are doing lots of things, but we also know that we want to be strategic and methodical we don't want to uh, uh, expose our children or our staff. Um, we want to be able to make sure we have everything in place and we're strategic about how we're moving. And so our plan was al always to look at bringing students back second semester. And so that is what the proposal from me would be. And I wanted to be able to see if the board had any other thoughts about that. Comments from the board, questions? No, um, no, I kind of like the idea, Dr. Fisher. Um, I do worry about uh, like special, the special day class <clears throat> because those kids would need a lot of help. And, uh, you know, a lot of them won't be able, wouldn't, be, <laughs> wouldn't be able to follow the six feet, uh, the mask, the hand washing, all that stuff by themselves. They pretty much all would need a one-on-one, -on -one, I would think, that, the ones that want to come back. Right. And with the K-6 waiver, we would only be able to bring back elementary students. Yeah. And um, we, would, we would definitely have to consider what that means for the, for the special day class students, of course. But with the small group, group cohorts, we can begin to bring those students back right away and putting them in small groups yeah. with their one-on-one -on -one assistance. Yeah. yeah. So that would be my concern because I, I have a little one with special, special needs and I don't want them coming back right now because just because of the aspect of, I don't think uh, he's going to be able, <laughs> they're going to, he's going to be able to keep a mask on and the hand cleaning. And he, you know, even with the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, he's got a great one, um, but still he's not there every day and take the breaks and, and he, you know, he can't fend for himself. So that's uh, one of my greatest concerns would be a special day class.
Anyone else? No, I think I like the plan. I think that's a good. I like that also. There was a question. Um, do if you apply for the K six waiver, do you have to open all grades at once, or can you select particular grades? The question from the right. You can. Um, it, it depends on your capacity. I know when we did the um, survey with parents, we looked at a TK2 option. Um, and so we can look at a modification of that. But whatever configuration we go with, it depends on our capacity to do so. Because if you split a, a kindergarten class, you need two rooms and two teachers, unless you do an AM and a PM version. Okay. And if we do the AM and the PM version, we have to look at the ability to disinfect and clean and do everything that has to be required before you can bring the next group in. And so those are all the things that we, we'd have to consider. Well, you don't even know how many students, if you went with the cohorts, you don't even know at this time, because that hasn't even been asked of the special ed parents, how many are willing to even let their students come back at this point. And that, you know, that might help make your decision right there. It might be even a much smaller number, which would make the social distancing and the, and the um, what we need, you know, what you need to watch the kids a lot easier at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. Right. So our plan in moving forward is to meet with our bargaining unit teams, well, actually the leads, the presidents, and we offered them an opportunity to bring who they would like to just discuss what's, what the options are and what would be your concerns, because we want to mitigate any concerns up front. But with regard to the waiver, we could apply, but we still may not be able to Students would only come back two days a week under a waiver regardless because of our capacity. And we'd have the risk factors to contend with. So our team has thought, let's stay the course. Let's monitor our data. And if we, br if we bring back, when we bring back small groups of students, we can then begin to make sure we have everything in place for everyone to come back after semester break. I think there's so many moving parts and I know my daughter is just starting to get into, you know, it's, it's taking this long just to start to feel that you're figuring this out. And if all of a sudden you throw a monkey wrench into that, that's, that's asking a lot of not just the students, but the teachers and the parents and everybody else involved. And then the other thing I spoke about today with the superintendents were for those districts who are going back to case, going on a case six waiver, what happens to those parents who say, no, I don't want my child to come back yet? Those teachers can't teach in the classroom and also do distance learning with the ones who don't want them to come back. So we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what that would even look like. If you have a third grader whose parent says, no, I'm not ready for them to come back. So our team has internally spoken about it and we're still working through some things. Um, we, we'd like to be able to immediately meet the needs of our students with the greatest need by moving ahead with the small group cohorts. Let's get those kids what they need initially. Then we can track and monitor and see how we're doing. And then if get through flu season, because it's coming, and then um, work to be able to bring the students back in January which is what the task force and everyone had planned to do initially. And with these small group cohorts, our students who are having a difficult time connecting with technology and internet and all of that, they would be able to come on campus and connect and that would solve that learning. We have a phased we're planning a phased model. The first phase would be get our SDC students in. And then in two weeks, and we had this conversation with the principal of the high school, any students that are the highest level of risk, it could be those, we're gonna start with those students who are having connectivity issues. Mm -hmm. They have to be in that group. 
We also said, well, let's look at seniors. If there are any seniors that are needing interventions that are at risk of not graduating, they would be in those groups. So the, high, the schools have already started to identify which students would be in those small group cohorts. And then we strategically monitor and uh, make sure that things are ready when we bring everybody back. Paul, did you have any questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, I, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. So my, my question is, <clears throat> I don't think anything's changed in, in reality since this started in March. Nobody knows where we're going to be in a month. So I don't understand why we wouldn't apply for the K-6 waiver. It's going to take a, I don't know how long to get it. And then we can see where we are as a district at that time. We don't, just because we get it, we don't have to put it in place, do we? You do not have to apply. You do not have to do the waiver. Um, and No, no, that's, that's not what I said. Yeah, I know what you're saying. We, we apply for it, and then if we don't want, it, if we don't want to uh, utilize it, we'll, we'll still have the approval to do it. By the time, I think it takes about, they said about seven to 10 days to get the, um, the response from public health as to whether or not your waiver is approved. And so we could apply for it and we would know closer, close to that October 13th date that we're going to know whether or not we can open anyway. So we could apply, but it's going to take a little while to, to put the application together, meet with the teachers, unions, meet with the parents, because you have to do that before you apply. Then submit your application, and we've had this conversation, talking with Norma yesterday, already about the application and what's on there. We could apply and put the application in, but it's going to take the public health department a period of time to respond to us. And by the time they respond to us, we could be close to that October 13th date to know whether or not we can bring everybody back. So the question on many superintendents' minds right now is, do I engage in this waiver process or do I wait to see what's gonna happen around October 13th? And if we're engaging in the waiver process, is our purpose to be able to bring back K-6? We're not going to be able to do that in a model unless it's hybrid anyway because of the capacity issue, even if we did TK-2. So... That's our dilemma. I don't know if that answers your question, Mr. Green. Well, yes, it does. But I, my opinion on this is our K-2 to K-3, we, we, not just in Selma, across the nation, are by nobody's fault, but it's putting a generation of three or four grade levels a year behind. And we're going to as is everybody else, <clears throat> we're going to move a second grader on to third grade when they're really a second grader. We're going to move a first grader to second grade when they're really a first grader. And these kids are going to be behind forever. I, I just think the sooner, the more, the, the, as soon as absolutely possible, we can put at least the K through sec, whatever our capacity is, K second, K three in place. And I just think the longer we wait to see what happens, the longer that we delay the, the ability to put them. Because even when, even if the county says on the 13th, you can, you can go, you still got to go through the, the negotiations with the union. You still got to talk to parents. You still got to do all the same stuff. I just think by applying for the waiver, whether, whether we use it or not, or even whether we get it, it, moves the process of everything along faster, which is, in my view, a benefit to those, those K, K2 to K3 kids. 
I understand, I understand what you're saying. One of the things that we want to remember is we can do the small group, group cohorts now. And we, we don't have to wait for the waiver process, but there's no harm, no foul in, in applying for the waiver and having that option. And I think I, that's what Mr. Green is saying. Uh, you can apply for the waiver, but you may or may not choose to use it. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I think that, and, and we, we've spoken about that. We've looked at the waiver form, and we, I think Norma is here, and she's, we've already started to pencil some things in in case we want to go that route. There is a process, though, that you have to meet with folks even before you apply. But shouldn't we be meeting with those folks anyway, regardless if you're applying for the waiver or not, because you're going to have to figure out what's going to be the best going forward, and you're still going to need the stakeholder mm -hmm. input, whether you're applying for the waiver or not. We certainly do want to have the stakeholder input. You're correct. Um, we, we are uh, looking at regrouping the task force so the task force can kind of know where we are as well. So um, what I'm hearing from our conversation is there's support for moving ahead with the small group piece, even if we apply for the waiver, let's do what we can now. And then we can, we can also apply for the waiver and make some determination if we're gonna use the waiver or not, because October 13th will be pivotal to the District of Fresno County. And then we can decide at that time, how is that small group cohort going? Um, are there any things we need to do to adjust to get ready for January? And we can decide, well, we want to bring the kids back for a month under K-5, everybody. I think we'd have to resurvey our parents also to see if they would want to come back because that will also impact our ability to be able to house everyone. So I think I understand and uh, we'll move in that direction then. I think it's, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So I think that would be the direction I would go. Okay. Thank you. Are there are no further questions. Mm -hmm. There are just a couple comments that um, regarding bringing the, the, the ELs back, the, right. um, the ELs back, mm -hmm. they are still having connectivity issues and home alone to have access to the help, so that right. would be a good um, way I to get agree. them back. I agree. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, on to consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion from Diana, second from Carl to uh, Approved consent agenda as presented. Any other questions or comments? None. Myself, I. Paul. Hi. Roger. Hi. Carl. Hi. Diane. Hi. Motion passes. We have one donation for you to the board tonight from Linda Franco. A donation of a desk and a computer table for a student worth the, uh, with a value of one hundred dollars. Uh, we recommend the board accept this donation. I'll second. Question from Carl, a second from Diane to approve donation as presented. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none. Uh, Paul? Hi. Roger? Hi. Carl? Hi. Diane? Hi. Myself? I. Motion passes. Thank you. I just would like to move forward the second reading of the board policy updates as presented. And this is to go ahead and approve them, correct? That is correct. Okay. Any questions from the board regarding those? If not, we need a motion to approve the policies. I'll motion to approve and adopt the board policy updates. Second. Motion from Diana, second from Carl to approve. Um, the board policies. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none. Uh, Roger? Aye. Carl? Aye. Dan? Aye. Myself? Aye. Paul? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. 
Oh, oh. Okay. Yes, I wanted to be able to bring information back to the board with regard to the research uh, that I did regarding term limits uh, for uh, board members. I think that was a, 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 a question and uh, a directive for us to get more information on. So I worked with the county superintendent of schools, their legal counsel department, and um, I also worked with the Fresno County Clerk's Office to get some more information, and these, this is the information they shared. Um, it would require a voted board decision to proceed to establish a voter initiative to create term limits for elected positions. So it's, it is legally permissible to be able to um, establish a, an initiative for term limits, but in order to move in this direction, the entire board would have to make the decision to move in that direction, and there would have to be a board resolution adopted. So it would have to be a board decision by majority to move in that direction. Once the board makes that decision and approves a resolution, the board would retain counsel to be able to work with the county clerk's office uh, to begin the process and pay any applicable filing fees and follow the procedures for creating a ballot statement. Some of the things that boards might want to consider if they're moving in this direction are the costs. Election costs will vary based on the number of participating jurisdictions or municipalities. That's why districts try to bundle things. If they're going to go, they're gonna go when another couple of communities are going uh, on, an, on an, uh, an election year to be able to mitigate any cost because the cost is reduced by the number of communities participating in the election. The number of, of uh, municipalities that may participate in an election can be determined by what type of election. Is it a special election? You might have fewer com communities involved in a special election. Is it a primary election? Is it just a local election? So depending on the type of election, that can impact the cost. The more participants in terms of communities, the less cost to each of those community participants. The county clerk's office wanted to be sure that we understood that they were providing us a range and the general cost can range from 50,000 to $100,000 to your district. Again, depending on the number of municipalities or jurisdictions that are engaged during an election cycle. So the next possible election dates would be for March 2021 or November 2022. The county clerk's office couldn't uh, provide any information about uh, the March election cycle. He said generally there might be a local, a local um, community, I think he said Clovis might have an election in March, um, but most wait until November when there are, when it's either a um, local elections in November or, yeah. March is not as popular, apparently, what, according to what he shared. But there are some communities that do go out in a for March election, but usually they're done in November. So um, this is the information, it is possible, it requires a, a a vote of the board by majority to move in this direction. And um, it will require legal to be a part of the process. And there is likely to be uh, significant cost to the board for moving in that direction. So that's what my findings are. Uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, when you say majority, is it a simple majority? 
I thought I heard you say all five. No, it just has to be a vote, uh, a majority, majority vote. Not unanimous, but majority vote. Any other questions or comments? Now we'll go on to the next item. Fiscal budget. Okay, I wanted to be able to provide the board with an update as to where we are with the budget advisory committee. And um, I shared this information with you earlier so that you could kind of have an idea of, of, uh, of where we're going with this. I won't go through each slide because you were able to see it earlier. It's the budget advisory. It's the... Yes, please. So what I wanted to just start with was um, I shared with you the organizational structure. I looked at our own board policies to make sure that um, uh, because we've not really had a, an uh, articulated budget advisory council or committee, I wanted to make sure we were aligning things with our own board policies. And so these are things that were highlighted in our board policy. And I think what I want to highlight here is that this group is established by the superintendent or designee, and this group acts in an advisory capacity. The purpose is not to usurp the board's governance or oversight. And as an advisory, um, this group can meet to make recommendations to the superintendent, superintendent's cabinet, to be able to bring information to the board as the board is is making decisions about uh, district fiscal matters. The advisory committee is not subject to uh, Brown Act provisions. Um, they act just as a school site council and parent advisory council, so they're not subject to Brown Act provisions. Um, I'm on the per next, next slide, I'm sorry. Purpose of the committee. These are the things, the fundamental elements when we bring the committee together, that we want everyone to understand what the purpose is. It's to promote greater understanding, increase our transparency, and um, most importantly, what I want to share is that the purpose of the committee is not to audit the district's financial operations, but to be familiar with the district's financial data and how we make decisions understanding our instructional program, understanding the board's priority. That's the purpose of the committee and also to build goodwill in the community because these stakeholders will be able to go back and share information with members of the community who may or may not understand why the board is taking a position or why the district is recommending certain things. So they also become stewards of goodwill in the community as committee members. Next slide, please. Because this is going to be a very strategic process for us, it's important that we're um, making sure everyone understands in this budget advisory committee that there are distinct roles and responsibilities. So these are the, some of the roles and responsibilities of trustees. Um, I'm going to ask that if you all have uh, suggestions as to who may serve on the committee, that you would provide me with those names. Um, the board may, uh, will recommend or may recommend specific objectives and priorities for the committee. Well, we're going to be aligning those with the goals that we've already established. And then the board will receive committee input via the superintendent or the designee. So uh, then the roles of the superintendent is to form the committee and make sure that we're meeting regularly, establish and appoint members have objectives, and then meet with the committee to make sure that communication is ongoing and that we're uh, receiving input. The assistant superintendent, next slide please. The role of the assistant superintendent serves as facilitator of the committee. He knows the district's business. He knows the district's finances. Uh, along with the superintendent, the assistant soup will facilitate the committees uh, work with me to recommend the meeting schedules, recommend the agenda items, 
and then develop and present information by uh, the committee. The assistant superintendent and I would also share information back with the board. So just being clear as we're moving in this direction, what everyone's role is. Potential committee members, I think one of our challenges is that we keep the committee small enough to get things done, but large enough to have enough diversity and perspective. So the average number should be about 12 to 15, and everyone doesn't come all the time. So these are some people who may serve as committee members. Uh, board members are welcome to participate as long as it's less than a quorum. And um, of course, our bargaining unit members and district and school administrators. This, I would like to add a, stu a high school student to serve on the budget committee because we want to make sure we always have the student voice represented. And so we also want to include, uh, invite any business or community member to uh, apply to serve on the committee. So next steps, we have finalized the application and the selection process. We will put applications up on the district website. And so there will be an application process and I will meet with, not just me myself, myself and Larry um, and um, I haven't determined who will, else will be on the selection committee, but it will be district staff. And uh, we'll go through some things because we want to make sure that we establish a committee that's highly diverse in their thinking and that represents the stakeholders in our community. And so we want to go through a selection process to make sure we have a good diverse committee. And so we've established these as, as tentative meeting dates as we're moving forward. So I just wanted to give you an update and to see if you had any questions or feedback and ask if you have names for individuals that you think you would like to recommend serve on the committee, if you could get me those names um, because I'm compiling the list. And again, I'm looking for a diverse group, diverse in perspective and diverse in representing the Selma community. Any questions from the board? Paul, you have any questions? Good evening, everyone. So nice to see you all. Um, we're here to bring the final version of the uh, learning continuity and attendance plan uh, for the district. We brought it to you, we brought a draft to you at your previous board meeting for a public hearing. Um, and we since then have received feedback, feedback from the county um, in terms of some areas that we um, wanted to go back and look at um, in, in order to revise for our final draft. We, I don't know if it showed up in your copies, but we, we left in blue the newer information um, and I've just noted a little bit here, uh, there are just a couple areas that we had to revise. And one was for the actions that were contributed, which means they were paid out of supplemental and concentration funds. There was a very, very specific way that they asked that we write those action plans. And so you'll see in the budget sections, you'll see something that says very plainly, you know, paid for ingenuity. And there's a in, which means it did not contribute because we didn't use supplemental concentration funds. And then you'll see something else like professional learning and there's a paragraph underneath that. And that's, that's per the expectations from the county that if we use supplemental and concentration funds from our LC, LCFF budget, that we had to write those action plans in that very specific manner. So that was one of the revisions that we, we went back and did. Um, in the section for supports for pupils with unique needs, we were asked to address what we were doing or what we were providing or would be providing specifically for our foster youth, our students experiencing homelessness, and our English learners. Um, I had a great uh, conversation at DAT, followed up with a uh, conversation with um, our county coach in terms of um, there are many things that we're doing for all students, and that's absolutely what, you know, is expected of our district and every district in the state of California. But the 
plan also called for getting very specific about what we were doing for the targeted student groups that were that were called um, out in the plan. So we did go back and add some uh, language regarding our foster youth and our students experiencing homelessness. And then we also went back and refined the language um, that described what we were providing for our English learners. The um, same thing uh, for the section for pupil learning loss. Same request um, when we when I met with the county coach was okay. So you you talk about what you're doing for all students. So how will that be differentiated for students who are experiencing learning loss, including those student groups again? And so we we did go back and add language that just really really defined what we were doing for those student groups. And those things um, include um, tutorials. There are special um, educational resources and. Uh, programs that were purchased to support um, our English learners. We know that um, through pupil services, there's a lot of communication uh, working with uh, families who um, have foster youth with them or students experiencing homelessness to make sure that they were providing them some of the resources that they may need. Um, and then the other um, area that they asked us to just be a little bit more specific was um, the explanation regarding mental health and social emotional services. And just the need to just ensure that we expanded that to include what we were doing for staff, what we were doing for students, and what we're doing for our families. Um, and then um, the big section that you will see, and we had been working on it, um, and so we were ready to include it in this final version of the plan, are the tiered supports for pupil engagement and family outreach. So this is um, what is it that we're going to, how will we be supporting our students who are struggling with um, coming into classes either because of connectivity issues or, you know, I have a freshman in high school, sometimes it's not um, the, the thing they want to do. And so how, you know, we're, how are we going to work with students who are not engaging, who are not um, participating in the way that we would want all students to be participating. And as required um, in the plan, it did need to be a tiered system so that we're working through students, uh, tier one, what are we doing? tier two, tier three, and there is also a tier, I believe a tier four. Um, and so we, um, starting at the school site, classroom level, school site level, and then at the district level, how are we supporting our families? Because our goal is that every student engage and participate in our distance learning programs. And then the final area that um, we had to revise, and in the conversations with the county, they were extremely helpful in helping clarify what it is that those last prompts were actually asking for. Um, and so in those conversations and looking at some of the sample um, language that they provided districts, I was able to work with our coach and, and make sure that those two um, prompts were addressed correctly and appropriately. And so um, those were the revisions that we did to the plan. Other than that, I think there were just maybe minor things, um, some past tense verbiage that I had left in the beginning of the stakeholder section. So um, just like the LCAP, it received input from all of our stakeholders along the way, and um, it will serve as our plan for this school year. Um, we, we, I believe we talked about it at DAT. Nobody is saying anything about like the accountability part somewhere along the line, but we know um, whether the state uh, requires that um, or not as a district, we know that we, as Dr. Fisher mentioned earlier, that we're gonna be using data um, to, to determine how, how well we're implementing the things that are noted in the plan and then where we may need to refine um, in order to, um, to make sure that we, we implement what we said we were going to do in the plan and make sure that it's a benefit to our students in our community. This is the final, of the final version of the plan. We had a motion to approve. I, I don't, I, a motion to approve 22D. Yeah. I'll second. Motion from Carl and a second from Diane to approve 22D as presented. Any other questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, Carl? Aye. Diane? Aye. Myself? Aye. Paul? Paul, are you still there? Yeah. Aye. <laughs> and Roger? Aye. <laughs> motion passes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any business? Item 23B1, uh, we did experience a, uh, a uh, ransomware attack at the end of last month. 
in order to absolutely minimize the amount of time that our network was unavailable, uh, we, we brought in a uh, very highly regarded cybersecurity firm in, from Fresno. Uh, their name is Breadcrumbs. Uh, and uh, so, uh, we were very fortunate that you've had read about some of the other districts throughout the country who have experienced similar uh, events. Um, some of those schools were down for many days. Uh, we were down, for, uh, we were totally down for an afternoon and then we had experienced some, some hiccups uh, the following day. But I think we did really, really well considering what some of the other districts are experiencing. Uh, the cost to breadcrumbs so far has been just under 36000 They are still working, but the, the, I believe the bulk of their, uh, our expense to them is passed. And we're bringing this to the board as a ratification because we did bring them in uh, as soon as we possibly could. I think uh, I saw on the contract that Eric signed us at 1130 on a Sunday night or a Monday night. Uh, so it was absolutely an emergency. Do you have any questions on this uh, this item? The contract for one year or how long? Um, it is an it is an as needed. So we when we have a need, we call them and ask them for the service. And there's there's in their contract uh, the cost of each of their services is delineated. So we know what the cost is going to be when we ask for it. Uh, but they don't they don't provide service unless we ask them to provide the service. It's more, it's, it's, I guess you could you could picture it kind of like an attorney or if you need the service, you call them and ask for it and they charge you for it. Yeah, move to accept 23B1. Second. A motion from Roger, a second from Carl to um, accept 23B1 is presented. Any other questions or comments? And then Diane. Aye. Myself, aye. Paul? Aye. Roger? Aye. And Carl? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, we currently have agreements with three of our uh, local agencies to purchase fuel from our pumps the City of Selma, Consolidated Irrigation, and the Fresno County Rural Transit Authority. Uh, we, those, Agreements have expired. We'd like to renew those, and I, I'm asking the board. The only uh, difference in these agreements is I'm asking the board to tack on a one percent fee, so we can start saving up some money to to eventually replace those pumps and replace the tank. The the pumps um, are very old. Uh, they they um, they really need to be replaced now. I would, would really love to be able to replace those now, but. Uh, Failing that, I'd like to start setting aside some money to do that. Uh, the tanks are in very good shape. Um, I always live in fear that the Air Board is going to come at us, one, show up one day and say, nope, got to get rid of these. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to start banking some money towards the cost of replacing those items. Uh, so if the Board approves, I, I, I don't believe it matters. If, if you choose to, uh, to make a motion on all three items, that would be your choice. That's not necessary. If not, uh, but we'd like to ask the board to approve agreements with all three entities, and these are two-year agreements. Larry, you said uh, for one percent, right? The, so they, for example, the city, their cost averages around uh, between ten and fourteen thousand dollars per month for all the fuel that they, they buy. So we would tack on one percent to that amount and put it in, into a reserve account. Dude, I wonder if we can go more. <laughs> <laughs> that is already an increase, isn't it, Larry? They are not paying any additional fee at this time, right? They're they're just paying our exact our actual cost. Mr. Taxier, you think that one percent is good enough? Well, at the at the rate that these entities purchase fuel, um, that we could probably raise. I think I might have even put that in my memo. Uh, I, we might raise five thousand dollars a year. Let me see if I added that in my memo. <coughs> Sorry. 
Oh, yeah, you said uh, three to four thousand yeah. per year. Uh, so, so are they aware that you're going to? Yes. Yeah, we've, we've warned them at a time okay. that we're asking. And they didn't balk at it. They, they actually didn't say anything. <laughs> I haven't had a response from from any of any of the agencies. I mean, well, it's a lot of wear on tear that we got to pick up. So I understand the one percent. I'm just thinking that if you wanted, if Mr. Texer thought um, it, we would need a little bit more for it from it, I'd be okay with it. If you wanted to go back and ask for more. I agree. Yeah. And the form of real estate. So what if we have to clean the land on yeah, I, I informed them. I sent them each an email that um, with a copy of the proposed agreement and pointed out we're asking for one percent. And they, yeah, they, they knew that we were asking for that. Um, and again, none of them responded. Uh, yes, yes or no. I think they know they're getting the deal. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are. Um, well, Mr. Texera, if you'd wanted to go to go a little bit higher, I, I would support it. If you think it's where it is, and that's fine too. Do you have any idea how much to replace the pumps? I do not. I'm sorry, I don't have that cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, yes, it, well, it's and it's on the it's public agenda now. It's on it, that's that's what was on the agenda. If we were to table it pending a little bit more information, is this something that we would have to that we could? No, we, we would just continue on a month to month basis charging our actual cost. I think it would be worth a little bit of time and ener time and effort to find out how much in order to replace the, the pumps would be. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, why not? Yeah, it would only be fair. Yeah. Okay. Paul, you have any objections to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. okay. So we need a motion to table. I'll make the motion to table. Second. That would be for uh, all three. All three. Well, yeah. I'll just we can just do B two so if you're okay with okay, that. Okay, yeah, B two. Right. Okay. A motion from Roger and a second from Carl to table um, B twos, B twenty three B twos um, for um, further information. <coughs> Other questions or comments from the board? Um, hearing none. Myself, I. Paul. Aye. Roger. Aye. Carl. Aye. And Diane. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. He's second, yes. Okay, the next item is, a, is an annual request we bring to the board uh, to move money between funds. Uh, and for the most part, these are, are very routine. The general fund pays the employee benefits for employees who are in the adult, who are paid out of the adult fund, out of the cafeteria fund. And once a year, we ask the board to make a fund transfer from those two funds back to general to reimburse the general fund. In addition, we have a couple of cases where uh, one fund has uh, uh, either by act because of an accident and, and budget coding or because of a cash flow item, a lack of cash in that particular fund, the, the general fund paid some fees for a building fund. Uh, in one unusual case, the, um, the Kiwanis Club made a donation of $30,000 towards the uh, cost of the track, and we deposited that into the general fund, and now we're asking the board to move that into the building fund, which was where the track was paid for. Um, so it's, it's for the most part, it's, these are all, all routine requests to uh, ask the treasurer's department to make fund transfers between these funds. Do you have any questions on these requests? Motion. motion to approve 23C. I'll second. second it. Motion from Diana, second from Paul. Um, 
to um, approve 23C as presented. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, Paul? Aye. Roger? Aye. Carl? Aye. Diane? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, on 23D, uh, I have an unusual uh, proposal and request of the board. Uh, we currently have uh, two elementary band directors. One is a full-time teaching position, and the second position has always been paid just a few hours a week on a supplemental uh, time basis. Uh, never a contractual position. And um, this position was created about in 2005, and it was originally uh, for about um, just a couple of hours a week. Over the years, it would increase to uh, three hours a week. Uh, the, the individual approached me who has this position and asked, could this be moved to a contractual position uh, because of the amount of work that the individual was actually doing. Um, and I, I have to say that I, I do not know why it was ever placed on a supplemental position uh, rather than a contractual position, but it really should be a contractual position. The person is a credentialed uh, instructor uh, and uh, holds a full music credential. Um, so uh, the request that I'm uh, bringing before the board tonight would be to convert that position from a supplemental position to a 40% contractual position. There would be a dollar increase of 14,616 per year. Uh, it would not include a benefits package because at a 40% uh, contract, uh, the individual is not offered a partial benefits package where uh, the person would pick up 60%. So there is no benefits package on the table with that. Uh, uh, for that though, we would also increase the hours uh, from what amounts to six hours per week to uh, 40%, which would total 14 hours per week. Uh, the, the numbers in the elementary band have swelled since 2014 and, and have gone up by at least 50. Uh, we did not use numbers this year because this is not a common typical year for band recruitment. Um, so um, again, I'm asking the board to just convert that position to a 40% contractual position. If you have any questions regarding this request, and it would come from the sup supplemental and concentration uh, funds. Is this uh, position right now um, working more than usual? I would not really. You so said there's an increase in time now. The. Um, the way I calculated it was to look what her entire uh, supplemental time was for um, for one year, and again, not using 1920 because it was an atypical year, and then divided that by the hourly rate, and uh, she was working much more than six hours per week. Um, so uh, was she working 14 hours uh, per week? No, but on some times, um, she was also paid to help clean band instruments and things like that, uh, which uh, greatly reduced our cost to that band budget when she would take on that work and, and um, help clean and repair the instruments that she was capable of doing. So yes, she was working well beyond um, uh, three hours per week. Uh, but again, the numbers in the band program warrant that. Uh, over the years, she's picked up an additional school. Uh, when she first started, she only worked at Roosevelt and she's picked up those about Garfield. Uh, with the numbers swelling, it's a lot of work for two people to, well, it's actually one full-time and one part-time. It's a lot of work for those individuals to do. So she could possibly help lighten the load uh, with the other band director in elementary as well. So is she actually doing more work right now though? She's not, not doing right more now. than the 14 hours. She's doing more than three hours per week. Yeah. And she's, uh, she's probably, quite frankly, the type of individual who works more than what she puts down on a timesheet. Uh, um, I would actually like to wait on that. But whenever the board wants to do the board. 
It's just that, I mean, she's been, it's been at like this for how many years? 15. Yeah. And she, yeah. We need a motion from the board. I'll motion to approve 23D. I'll second. Motion from Dan. A second from Carl to approve 23D as presented. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, Roger? Uh, no. Uh, Carl? Aye. Dan? Aye. Myself? Aye. Paul? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. On 23E, you have a proposal before the board to create two uh, eight hour temporary information technology support technicians. Uh, this department has experienced a huge, huge uh, increase in the number of um, uh, items that are that come through a help, help desk for both, uh, well, for uh, certificated staff, parents, and students who are having technology issues. Um, I need to. I apologize. I need to Um, the temporary positions uh, would uh, be from uh, basically October 14th. That's what, when they would uh, go through the next board meeting um, uh, through June 30th. Uh, because we are asking for eight hours, it does include a benefits package with statutory benefits as well. Um, so the total would be um, between 106204 and 114876 uh, based on where that those individuals fell on the salary schedule. Um, this would be from the CARES Act funding. It would not be a general fund expense, and the physicians would uh, definitely um, uh, be eliminated, so to speak, uh, come June 30th as temporary positions. This is not a layoff situation at all. A temporary position is created for a very, very specific period of time and has an, a start date and an end date that are clearly identified. And again, the purpose for this request is because of the extremely high volume of technology issues that all three of those groups are trying to access the IT department at this time. If you have any questions regarding this request. These are just temporary positions. Uh, I'm good yes, they're, they're called, they're, the Ed Code gives us the latitude to create temporary positions that uh, are in the classified service. So they're not permanent positions. They won't become permanent. Uh, and we do not have to go through any kind of layoff. It's for a very short period of time when uh, additional work is needed. Yeah, I'll, I'll motion to move ahead if no one else has questions. The 23 I'll second. Motion from Roger and a second from Carl to approve 23E is presented. Any other questions or comments? And then Carl. Uh, Diane. Aye. Myself, aye. Paul? Aye. And Roger? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, no conference attendance or field trip request right now. 23H. 23H is just a matter of record. Um, annually, we have to update the conflict of interest code. And we had some organizational shifts at the executive cabinet level. And so this is the, uh, this is the update reflecting that. Motion to approve 23H. Second. Motion from Diana, second from Roger to approve 23H as presented. Any other questions or comments? And then Diane? Aye. Myself, aye. Paul? Aye. Roger? Aye. And Carl? Aye. Motion passes. Um, anybody have anything for board report tonight? <laughs> we just have a couple things we'd like to share with you. I think we have some facilities updates for Mr. Texera and Mr. Texera. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, they are, are working on the gym floor as we speak, and it's. Uh, I understand it is looking very good. Uh, you also, if you have been by the high school gym, you notice that our our Bears mural is gone. It's been uh, it was blasted off and painted over. 
and it will be the mural that is being put up in its place is going to be amazing. I think everybody is going to be very, very pleased with the, the new mural. Um, but uh, even, even you know, because that the old mural, it was it was getting into some pretty poor condition. So having that new paint up there looks really good. Uh, we are uh, had a very good conference call last week with the arch I'm sorry with the uh, our facilities consultant CFW. Uh, we had about an hour meeting with uh, prospective architects talking about our phase one and phase two modernization projects coming up. Uh, their uh, the re their responses to our requests for uh, proposals are due at the end of this week. We will do some paper screening. Uh, there were the the uh, CFW counted about ten separate architect firms that were on that call, so he felt that was a very good sign that uh, a lot of companies are interested in getting our work. And we're going to try to screen those that number down uh, down to about three or four, and interview on October fifth. Uh, so we'd definitely like a, a board member on that panel. Uh, Dr. Fisher, myself, and uh, Rocky, our, IT, our uh, facilities director, MOT director, will be on that panel. And we will do those in person, so they'll, we, they'll be able to bring their props with them and have their, their members uh, put on their proposals for us. We'll probably do those here in this room so we can distance properly. And uh, hopefully at your October 13th meeting, we'll be able to bring that the panels uh, choice of one or two architects for our next phase. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. I know we were going, we spoke about um, any update with regard to, there was something Alex was doing with the mills. Yes, I have, I have want, some information there. You want to go ahead and share that while you're there, please? Uh, so we're, we continue to tweak the child nutrition program based on uh, participation, based on the weather and smoke and uh, based uh, also on the uh, different waivers that we're getting from USDA and from the, the Department of Education. Currently, we are uh, dis distributing three meals per day, and those are going from four different school sites, Lincoln, Selma High, Eric White, and Roosevelt. Uh, meals are still being distributed uh, from 3 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., in August, uh, we distributed 29,000 meals, which is an average of about 1,800 per day. And at that time, we had to uh, require students, uh, we had to require that parents show the IDs for their students. So this, the meals had to be given out to some unified students. Uh, since that time, a waiver has been granted uh, nationwide, which allows us to distribute meals to any student, or any child, 18 and under. So we no longer require IDs, but, uh, but we do require that they just give the name of, this, of the child for whom the students, the uh, meals are being picked up. So our, our staff is just writing, simply writing down the names of the child. Uh, so uh, in September, up to this point, we have distributed just under 43,000. So we've gone from 29,000 to 43,000 with those changes and uh, which averages out to about 3,000 per day. Uh, starting October 1st, the plan is to, to cut down the, uh, the number of days we are distributing meals down to two days per week. On Wednesday, Wednesdays, students, uh, families will receive meals for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And uh, Friday, they will pick up meals for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and we're missing missing Tuesday and there's some, but you, you get the idea. Um, and also the staff will be, as Alex reported at our last meeting, about half of the staff is home with COVID related issues, either because they have childcare issues or they're because of their own health. Um, and the staff, the remaining staff are working uh, later in the day. So they come in, I believe it's about 9, 9 a.m. to about um, 5, 5.30. Uh, now, uh, two days a week, they will retain, they will remain on that, that uh, shift, 
and the rest of the days they will be going back to their old shifts, which is about 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. So we're hoping that this will help those staff members who have their own you know, family issues that they have to deal with. Uh, hopefully this will allow them to go back to some um, semblance of normalcy with their own shifts. Any questions on that? I do. So two days a week, they're gonna come in at one time and then three days a week, they're gonna come in at a different time? That's the plan, yes. That's, you got little ones and you're still trying to deal with childcare, that might be an issue. I'm just thinking of my own, you know, and just that. I, I, I am confident that our supervisors in that department have had conversations with the staff because we have, the, the staff has made it very, very clear to us they don't like the midday shift. Yeah. They want to go back to that early morning shift, at least the majority. And so this is a, a, a compromise. It, it, as as, as yeah. you know, we, we're here to serve our families. Right. And our, if our, our families, we, we did the survey, it was not, it was, there was no clear majority of a specific time, uh, but the preponderance of those who responded prefer this later day shift, the later time frame to pick up the meals. So we, uh, we're hoping that going to two days will, you know, reach that happy medium for both the staff and the families. And then the number you threw out of 3,000 a day, is that, is that breakfast, lunch, and dinner? So are those each being counted as one, or is it? That is 3,000 meals, so it would be 1,000 families are picking up. So it's one, so it's, so it's, there's a, so it's breakfast, lunch, and it's actually 1,000, correct? Yeah, yes. I believe, yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. T. I know that you're continuing to work with your team to try to mitigate and make sure we're still committed to getting the families what they need. Um, while we're speaking about the small group cohorts, we're also considering how we're going to get those students fed when they come on and then when they leave to go off so those students will have access to meals. I just wanted to also share that while we're planning for the small group cohorts and and getting those students on campus as quickly as possible, those with the greatest needs. We have a target date of October 12th to begin that. We wanted to talk with the board first and then um, we're doing some internal planning. And part of that internal planning is making sure that we have all of our safe, health and safety things in place. And so I'm gonna ask Ms. Wood, um, we've done some work to make sure that we are in, in compliance um, and ready for when we bring students back on hybrid. We bring everyone back. So we're making the plans to do that now in preparation for the small group cohorts as well. Ms. Wood. Um, so uh, another plan that's required by the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA working in conjunction with each other is just simply called a prevention plan. And the whole purpose of that plan is to identify exactly what we're going to do to try to prevent the spread of any kind of illness. Um, so with that, um, I've worked on a template for all the school sites and uh, I've got a sample here from Wilson and um, uh, the plans are going to be very, very, very similar because our rules and our regulations and our expectations are going to be similar site to site. Wearing face coverings will be the same at Garfield as it is for Wilson. Uh, um, the six feet of social distancing will be the same. So the plans will look very similar, uh, but then the principals have turned around and are working on making certain things unique to their sites like ingress and egress and uh, what the small group cohorts will look like. The cohorts will of course look different at, at elementary than it will at the secondary site. So um, I have a sample here for you. And again, Wilson's is all done. And uh, again, this is just another uh, measure that we're taking to keep everybody safe and uh, also to follow those uh, government mandates that are placed on us. So I just want to acknowledge Ms. Wood. Um, we've been doing some behind the scenes planning and she was able to get this. Acknowledge Ms. Wood and her uh, team. We've been doing behind the scenes planning to get everything ready to go so we can get these students served as quickly as possible. And um, this is hot off the press, but I wanted her to be able to share it with you tonight. And we'll be sharing this with our bargaining unit folks this week as well. Okay. Can I ask a question about 
Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted you to lay your eyes on it first. So again, thank you, Ms. Wood. Um, the last thing I want to share with you is that we did um, receive the letter from the County Superintendent of Schools regarding our, our, our budget. And we did receive an approval for the 2021 adopted budget. And we're very proud of that. And there are just some highlights that I wanted to share with you uh, from the county superintendent's letter to let you know some things that we need to continue to think about as we're moving forward. Some of the key points from the letter is that we need to continue to monitor our cash flow, frequently updating our cash flow projections. And Mr. Texera has talked about this repeatedly, and so they've said it needs to be on the forefront. We need to notify the county office before we implement the need to secure a tax and revenue anticipation note or a TRAN. If our cash flows dip below a certain level and we need to execute a TRAN, we need to notify the county office. We need to make sure our cash deferrals are included in our cash flow projections. We know we're going to have some significant deferrals based on what we've heard from the uh, Department of Education on our funding and so forth. We need to make sure that we're uh, demonstrating this information in our projections. Monitor cash in all funds to support necessary interfund borrowing and monitoring repayment within the mandatory timelines. You might have to make some interfund borrowing. Monitor your cash flows, and if you do make that interfund borrowing, Make sure it's repaid within the met statutory timeline. And then continue to monitor and build our district cash reserves for long-term district stability. And I think the board has made it clear that that is our goal, to make sure we are fiscally solvent by looking at our, our um, cash reserves. So that's all I have. All right. Need a motion to adjourn. A motion. Second. Motion from Roger, second from Carl to adjourn. All in favor, myself, aye. Paul? Aye. Roger? Aye. Carl? Aye. Dan? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>